Bedtime. Part 1, the beginning. Bedtime is supposed to be happy. A happy event for tired children. For me, it's terrifying. Well, some children might complain about being put to bed before they have finished watching a film or playing their favourite video game. When I was a child, night time was something to truly fear. Somewhere in the back of my mind, it still is. As someone who is trained in the sciences, I cannot prove that what happened to me was objectively real. I can swear that I had what I experienced with genuine horror, a fear which in my life I am glad to say has never been equaled. I relate it to you all now as best as I can. Make of it what you will, but I'll be glad to ju- just get it off my chest. I can't remember exactly when it started, but my apprehension towards falling asleep seemed to correspond with my being moved into a room of my own. I was eight years old at the time. Until then, I had shared a room quite happily with my older brother. It is perfectly understandable for a boy, five years my senior, my brother, eventually wished for a room of his own. The result was given the room in the back of the house. It was a small, narrow, yet oddly ingolated room, large enough for a bed, a couple chest of drawers, but not much else. I couldn't really complain, because even at that age, I understood that we did not have a large house. I had no real cause to be disappointed, and my family was both living, loving and caring. It was a happy childhood during the day. A solitary window looked out in the back garden, nothing out of the ordinary. But even during the day, the light which crept into the room seemed almost hesitant. As my brother was given a new bed, I was given bunk air beds, which we used to share. While I was upset about sleeping on my own. I was excited as thought of being able to sleep in the top bunk, which seemed to be far more adventurous to me. For the very first night, I remember a strange feeling of knees creeping slowly from the back of my mind. I lay on the top bunk, staring down at my action figures and as cars strewn across the green-blue carpet. As imaginary battles and, and adventure took place between the toys on the floor, I couldn't help but feel that my eyes were being slowly drawn to the bottom bunk, as if something was moving in the corner of my eye. Something which did not wish to be seen. The bunk was empty, impeccably made from dark blue blanket, tucked and neatly partially covering two rather bland wet pillows. I can't, don't think anything, didn't think anything of it at the time. As a child, a noise slipping under my door was from my parents' television, bathing in a warm sense of safety, well-being. I fell asleep. When you awaken from a deep sleep to something moving and stirring, it can take a few moments for you to truly understand what is happening. The fog of sleep hangs over your eyes and ears, even when lucid. Something is moving, there's no doubt about that. At first I wasn't sure what it was. Everything was dark, almost pitch black, but there was enough light creeping in from outside to outline a narrowing suffocating room two thoughts appeared in my mind almost simultaneously the first that my parents were in the root bed because the rest of the house lay both in darkness and silence second thought turned to the noise a noise which had obviously woken me
As the last cobwebs of sweet withered from my mind, the noise took on a more familiar form. Sometimes the simplest of sounds could be the most unnerving, a cold wind whistling from a tree outside, a neighbour's footstep uncomfortably close, or, in this case, the simple sound of bedsheets rustling in the dark. That was it. Bed sheets rustling in the dark. Is this some disturbed sleep? I was attempting to get all too comfortable in the bunk, bottom bunk. I lay there in disbelief, thinking the noise is either my imagination or perhaps just my pet cat finding somewhere comfortable to spend the night. It was then I noticed my door shut as it had been as I fallen asleep. Perhaps my mum had checked on me and the cat sneaked into the room, my room then. Yes, that had been it. I turned to face the wall, closed my eyes, in vain hope I could fall back to sleep. The mood and rushing noise from underneath me ceased. I thought that, that I must have disturbed my cat. I quickly realised the visitor to the bottom bunk was more, much less mundane than my pet trying to sleep. And much more sinister. As I, as if I alerted to, and disquieted by my presence, the disturbed sleeper began to toss and turn violently, like a child having a tantrum in their bed. I could hear the sheets twist and turn, and increase the ferocity. Ferocity. Fear then gripped me, not like the sen- subtle sense of at knees and experienced earlier, but now potent and terrifying. My heart raced as my eyes panicked, scanning the almost impenetrable darkness. I let out a cry. As most young boys do, I distinctly shouted on my, to, on my mother. I could hear something stir on the other side of the house. As soon as I began to breathe, a sigh of relief. My parents were coming to save me. The bunk bed suddenly started to shake violently, as if gripped by an earthquake scraping against the wall. I could hear the sheets below me thrashing around, so as tormented by malice. I did not want to jump down to safety, as I feared the thing in the bottom bunk would reach out and grab me, pulling me into the darkness. So I stayed there, white knuckles clenching my only my own blanket like a shroud of protection. The weight seemed like an eternity. The door finally and thankfully burst open. I lay buried in light while the bottom there were the bottom bug, the resting place of my unwanted visitor, lay empty and peaceful. I cried and my mother consoled me. Tears of fear, followed by relief, steamed down my face, yet though all the horror and relief, I did not tell her why I was so upset, I couldn't explain it. But it was though whatever it had been in the bunk, it returned if I was even if so much spoke of it or uttered a single syllable of its existence. Whether that was the truth, I do not know. A child, I felt as if the unseen menace remained close, listening. My mother lay in the empty bunk, promising to stay there till morning. Eventually my anxiety diminished, tiredness pushed me back. Will sleep, remain re- sleep restless, sleep waking several not times, momentarily, the sound of rustling bed sheets. I remember the next day, wanting to go anywhere, be anywhere, but in that narrow, suffocating room, it was a Saturday. I played outside quite happily, my friends. Although our house is not large, we're lucky to have a long, sloping garden in the back. We played there often, as much as it of it was overgrown 
who could hide in the bushes, climb huge sycamore tree which towered above all else. And easily imagine ourselves in the throes of a giant brand of into some untamed exotic land. <clears throat> As fun as it all was, occasionally my eye would turn to the small window, orig- originally slight and innocuous, but for me that thin boundary was a looking glass, the strange cold pocket of dread. Outside the lush green surroundings of a garden field with smiling faces, my friends could not resist the creeping feeling crawling its way up my spine. Each hair standing on end, the feeling of something in that room watching me play, wanting for the night, waiting for the night when I would be alone, eagerly filled with hate. It may sound strange to you, but that by the time my parents asked me back into the work room the, the night, I said nothing. I didn't protest. I didn't even make an excuse as to why I didn't sleep there. So I simply and suddenly walked into that room, climbed a few steps into the top bunk, and then waited. As an adult, I would be telling everyone about my experience. But even at that age, I felt almost silly to be talking about something which I really had no experience, evidence for. I would be lying, however, if I said that this was my primary reason, I still felt that this thing would be enraged if I had so much spoke of it. It's funny how certain words can remain hidden from your mind, no matter how blatant or obvious they are. One word came to me that second night, lying there in the darkness, alone, frightened, where a rotten change in the atmosphere, a thickening of the air, just something displaced it. As I heard the first casual twists of the bed sheets below, the first anxious increase of my heartbeat, the realisation that something was once again bottom bunk. That word, the word had been, which had been sent into exile, filtered up through my subconscious breaking free of all repression, grasping the air, screaming, etching, and carving itself into my mind. Ghost. As, it, uh, uh, as this thought came to me, I noticed that my unwelcome visitor had ceased moving the bed sheets lay calm and dormant, but it had been replaced by something more, far more hideous. A slow, rhythmic, rasping breath heaved and escaped from the thing below. I can imagine it just rising and falling with each solid, wheezing and garbled breath. I shuddered and hoped, beyond all hope, that it would leave, it would leave without occurrence. The house that lay at the, as it had the previous night, a thick blanket of darkness. Silence prevailed all but for the pre- prevented breath of my as yet seen bunkmate. I lay there terrified. I just wanted this thing to go, to leave me alone. What did it want? There's something else vaguely mistakenly chilling so surprised it moved it moved in a way different from before it threw itself around above bottom bunk it seemed unstrained without purpose almost animalistic its movement however was driven by awareness with purpose and with a goal in mind but the, lying, the thing lying there in the darkness a thing which seemed intent on terrorising a young boy calmly nonchalantly set up its laboured breathing was un- become louder as now only a mattress and a few flimsy wooden slats separated by a body from the unholy uh, from the unearthly breath below I lay there with my eyes filled with tears of fear which mere words cannot relate to you or anyone else of course through my veins I would not have you believe that this fear could have been heightened but I was so wrong I imagined this thing would look like 
sitting there listening from below my mattress, hoping to catch the slightest sense that I was awake. Imagination then turned into an near evolving reality. It began to touch the wooden slats which my mattress sat on. It seemed to caress them carefully, running what I imagined to be its fin- fingers and hands across the surface of the wood. Then with a great force it prodded angrily between two slats of the mattress, even though the padding for the padding it was felt so someone had viciously struck their fingers into my side. I let out an almighty crying, wheezing, shaking and moving thing. The bunk below replied kind by violently vibrating the bunk as it had done the night before. Small flakes of paint powdered into my, onto my blanket for the wall. As a frame, the bed scraped along it backwards and forwards. Once again, I obeyed in light. They stood by my mother, loving, caring, as if she always was. With a comforting hug, the calming words which eventually subdued my hysteria. Of course, she asked what was wrong, but I could not say, I dare not say, I simply said one word over and over and over again. Nightmare. This pattern of events that continued for weeks, if not months, night after night, I it would awaken. I would awaken to the sound of rustling sheets. Each time I had, I would scream as to not provide this abomination with time to prod and feel for me. With each cry, the bed would shake violently, stopping with arrival. My mother would spend the night nice on night in the bottom bunk, seemingly aware of the sinister folks children here, son, nightly. Along the way, I managed to feign illness a few times, come up with other less than truthful reasons for sleeping my parents' bed. But once after. But more often than I, not, I would be alone for the first few hours of each night in that place. The room with the light from the outside did not stir, sit right. Alone with that thing. With time, you can become desensitized to almost anything, no matter how horrific. I had come to realize that, for whatever reason, this thing would not harm me while in my mother was present. I'm sure the same would have been said for my father, but as loving as he was, waking him for sleep was almost impossible. After a few months, I'd grown accustomed to my nightly visitor. Do not mistake this for um, some unearthly friendship? I detested the thing. I still feared it greatly as I almost sensed its desires. Personality could call it that. But on the field with averted and twisted hatred, yet longing for me, or perhaps all things. My greatest fears was, were realised in the winter. The days grew short and longer nights merely provided this wretch with more opportunities. It was a difficult time for my family. My grandmother, a wonderful, kind and gentle woman, deteriorated greatly since the death of my grandfather. My mother was trying her best to keep her in the community as long as possible. However, dementia is a cruel and degenerative illness, rubbing a person their memories one day at a time. Soon she recognised none of us, and then it became clear she would need to be moved from her house to a nursing home. Before she could be moved or moved, my grandmother had a particularly difficult few nights. My mother decided she would stay with her. As much as I love my grandmother, I felt nothing but anguish at her illness. To this day, I feel guilty that my first thoughts were not of her, but that my nightly visitor might they do, should it become aware of my mother's presence, absence, her absence, presence. Being the one thing which I was sure was protecting me, the full horror of this thing's reach. I rushed home from school that day and immediately wrenched the bed sheets and mattress from the lower bunk, to moving all the slats and placing an old desk and set of chest of drawers, some chairs which we kept in a cupboard where the bottom bunk used to be, and I told my father I'd make an office which he found adorable. But hey, I would have dared if I give that thing a place to sleep for one more night. 
I got no approach. I lay there, knowing my mother was not in the house. I do not know what to do. My impulses were to sneak into her jewelry box and take a small family crucifix I had seen there before. While my family was not very religious at that age, I still believe in God. I hoped that somehow this would protect me. A low, fearful, anxious one gripping the crucifix under my pillow, tightening my hand, one hand, and sli- sleep eventually came. So I drifted off to dream. I hoped I would be would awaken in the morning without incidents. Unfortunately, that night was not was the most terrifying of all. I woke gradually. The room was once again dark, but my eyes had readjusted. Adjusted. I could gradually make out the window and door, the walls, some toys on the shelf, and even to this day, I shudder to think of it. There was no nonsense, no rushing of sheets, no movement at all. The room felt life, lifeless, lifeless, yet not empty. The nightly visitor at the Elm Court welcome, wheezing, hate-filled thing had, which had terrified, terrified me night after night, not, night after night, was not in the bottom bunk. It was in my bed. I opened my mouth to scream, but nothing came out. Utter terror had shaken the very sound from my voice. I lay motionless, but I could not scream. I could not let, did not want to let it know I was awake. I had not seen it. I could only feel it. It was obscured under my blanket. I could see it outline. I could see it, feel its presence. I dare not look. A weight of it pressed down on me and told me. Cessation I will never forget. I lay there. That well, When I say that I was past, do not exaggerate. Lying in motionless in the darkness. I was every bit scared and frightened. Young boy. It have, if it had been during the summer months, it would have been late by then. The grass of winter's long and unrelenting. I knew it would be hours before sunrise or sunset, which I yearned for. I was a timid child by nature. I reached a breaking point, a moment which, where I could not wait no more, which I could survive under this intimidating deviant of nation no longer. Fear can sometimes wear you out, make you threadbare, a shell of nerves, leaving only the slightest trace of you behind. I had got, I had to get out of that bed. I remembered the crucifix, my hand still lay underneath the pillow, but it was empty. I moved slowly my wrist around to find it, minimising as best as I could the sound of vibrations caused, but I could not be found. I had either knocked it off the top bunk or it had, I could not bear to think of it been taken from my hand. Without the crucifix I lost any sense of hope, even at, at such a young age, to be acutely aware that death is an intensely frightened of it. If I knew I was going to die in that bed, if I lay there, dormant, passive, doing nothing, I had to leave that room behind, but how? Should I leap from the bed and hope that I should I hope I make it to the door? What if it's faster than me? Oh, I should I slowly slip out of my that top bunk, hoping not to disturb my cunny bed lo- fellow. Realising it was not st- stirred when I moved, trying to find a crucifix, I began to have the strangest of thoughts. What if it was asleep? I hadn't been so much as breathed since I woken up. Perhaps it's resting, believing it had finally got me, and it was funny in my grass, its grass, or perhaps it was toying with me. After all, we've been doing just that for countless nights, and now with me under it, pinned against my mattress, no mother to protect me, whenever it was holding off, saving its victory, until the last possible moment, like a wild animal savouring its prey. I tried to breathe as shallowly as possible and mustardly, every mastering, every single ounce of courage I could. 
I reached over slowly with my right hand and began to peel the blanket off me. What I found under those covers almost stopped my heart. I did not see it, but as my hand moved the blanket, it brushed against something, something smooth and cold, something which felt unstately like a gaunt hand. I held my breath in terror, as I was sure it must know, now have. I held my breath in terror, as I was sure it must have known that I was awake. Nothing. It did not stir, it felt dead for a few minutes. I placed my head carefully further down the blanket. I felt a thin, poorly formed forearm. My confidence almost twisted sense of curiosity. Grew as I moved down further to the disproportionately larger boat set muscle. An arm was outstretched, lying across my chest, and a hand resting on my left shoulder, so if it grabbed me in my sleep. I realised I even had to move this Carnivorous appendages, but ever so much, as much to escape its grasp. For some reason, the feeling of torn, ragged clothing on the shoulder of this nightmare invader stopped me in my tracks. Fear once again swelled my stomach, my chest, and I recalled my hand, disgust at the touch of straggled, oily hair. I could not bring myself to touch its face, although I wonder to this very day what it would have felt like. Dear God, it moved. It moved, it's sudden, but his grip on my shoulder and across my body strengthened. No tears came, but God. How I wanted to cry as its hand and arm slowly coiled around me. My right leg brushed along the coil wall which the bed lay against. Oh, of all that happened to me in that room, this was the strangest. I realised this clutching, rented thing which drew great delight from violating the young boy's bed. It was not entirely on top of me. It was sticking out the wall like a spider striking from its lair. Suddenly its grip moved from slowly tightening to a sudden squeeze. It pulled and clawed at my clothes. It frightened and not... As if frightened the opportunity would soon pass. I fought against it, but in an emaciated arm was too strong for me. His head rose up, withering and contorting under the blanket. And then I realised it was where it had taken me, into the wall I fought for my dear life. I cried as suddenly my voice returned to me, yelling, screaming, but no one came. Now I realised why I, it was so eager to suddenly strike, why this thing had, had to have me now. Through my window, the window that seems to represent such malice, from the outside, street hope, the first rays of sunlight, I struggled further knowing if I could just hold on, it would be gone for good. As I fought for my life, the unearthly parasite shifted slowly, pulling itself up to my chest. It moved now, its head moved now. Now poking out from under a blanket, wheezing, coughing, rasping, I do not remember. I do not remember its features. I do I simply remember its breath against my face, foul and cold as ice. As the sun broke over the horizon, the dark, that dark place, a suffocating room of contempt, was washed, bathed in sunlight. I passed out its scorning fingers and circled my neck, squeezing the very life from me. I woke to my father after waiting to make me some breakfast. A wonderful sight indeed. I had survived the most horrible experience of my life. Till then, and now I moved the bed away from the wall. Leaving behind the furniture, I had to bleed. Stop the thing from taking a bed. Little did I think it would try to take mine and me. Weeks passed without incidents, yet one cold frost spring night I awoke to the sound of furniture where the bunk beds used to be, vibrating violently. A moment it passed, I lay there, sure, I could hear a distant wheezing coming from the deep within the wall, finally fading into the distance. I have never told anyone this story before, to this day I still break out in a cold sweat to the sound of the bed. Sheets rustling in the night, 
or wheeze brought on by common cold. You say you never sleep in my bed against the wall. Call it superstition, if you will. But as I said, I cannot discount conventional explanations from, from such as sleep paralysis. Rusting in the night of grease brought by a cold and cold, I've certainly never seen my bed against a wall. I call it superstition, if you will. But as I said, I cannot discount the conventional explanations such as sleep paralysis, hallucination, of that of an overactive imagination. But I can say this the following year, given a brother of a room on the other side of the house, my parents look, took this that strangely suffocating, unrelated room place as their bedroom. They said they didn't need a large room. Just one big enough for a bed and a few things. They lasted ten days. We moved on the 11th. Part 2 After writing my account of my horrific experience I had as an eight-year-old child, many have encouraged me to speak about the aftermath. I've been hesitant to do so as I felt unsettled since I broke my silence. Sleep had not come easy for me these last few nights. The scepticism had remained resilient as such. I, I will tell you that of what I experienced in the other room. This won't be as long as that what occurred only as what that what occurred and took place only a few days, but that was more than enough for me. You call after the home welcome nightly visitors left me. I moved to another bedroom like a year later. This room was much larger than the previous one, had a warm and welcoming atmosphere to it. Some places feel bad, this room almost felt foul. But this one did not. Frankly I was given a normal bed, a previous one had been taken apart for an hour. A welcome sight I might add you. I just loved my own new room, I enjoyed the space. For all of my boy toys, and I was happy that the place was large enough to have my friends drop by. But most of all, I believed to that just be out in that uneasy and foreboding part of the house. And for hours, I had slept soundly when I had done for a long, long time. Of course, I still moved my bed several feet from the wall. I told my mother that I had my friends like to use a gap between bed and wall as a hiding place when we were playing. I awoke the next morning feeling fresh and relaxed. As I lay there watching some of my favourite cartoons on a small portable television, I noticed something odd, an old brown, dark brown armchair, which had always been there, sat on foot on my bed, large and looming, is frayed and worn, having been given to us as part of a suite by my cousin, but it had been used many times even by then. The chair itself was not unusual, once set on me more, was, I could have sworn that before I went to sleep, the chair had been facing away from the bed. Now the cold light of day, the chair was facing me. I assumed one of my parents had moved it while I slept, probably looking for something which had been left there before we switched rooms. The second night was not as restful. It was around 11am. I could hear my parents' television on the dark side of the house. The room was largely in darkness, only an emanation of orange hue drifting through my window from the still lights outside. I lay there content, content until I heard something quiet, yet unmistakable. At first I thought it sound of my own breath, it's sailing and inhaling. And I rested, then I stopped for a moment. Moment seen audible's almost audible sound. Someone else in the room breathing in and out. At first I thought so my own breath it's sailing in and out as I rested. But when it stopped for a moment and the room quiet, almost audible sound of someone else in the room breathing in and out did not cease, continued reverently without pause. I lay there in the darkness, but, but while I was still recovering from the, my ter- from the terror, it still to me from my event experiences my broke previous bedroom. I'm not entirely afraid of breathing at a distance, and unlike the wheezing I had heard during my encounter, the thing the wall, I remember being calm, and even to that early 
an alien age. I believe that it was the Jew. So subtle. It was probably my imagination playing tricks on me. Still, I took no chances that on bed, walked across the room and turned the light on. The sound had gone. I started, stared at the old woman in the armchair, face to the foot of my bed, which was within reaching distance of where I slept. I turned it around to face another way. had no real reason to do so, but something about it sitting there filled me with dread. The third night, I was not, not so fierce. Again, I woke in the darkness, lying on my back, and stared at the ceiling, which seemed to happily absorb the dim orange light from the street. That tree outside my window swayed, a calm breeze casting a strange collection of improbable moving shadows across the room. I could hear nothing but the long and distant helm of the city night traffic. Just as I began to drift back into sleep, I heard it, a crack from the bottom of my bed, as if something had moved or shifted its weight on the floor. I raised my head, peering through the darkness, but saw nothing strange. Everything sat up. As it had done without the day, throughout the day, nothing was out of place. I cast my gaze across the room. Some comics on the floor, a few boxes are still being unpacked. The armchair moved, still facing away the, on the bottom of my bed. With nothing sinister here, I was fully awake, glancing over my at my television, considering whether or not to enjoy some late night TV. I have kept the volume low. Of course, my older brother would hear it in the next room. No doubt, tell me to switch it off. Just as I set up fully in bed, I heard it again, a low creak accommodated by sound, the sound of the slightest of movements. I looked again at the room, the dim orange shadows cast, while leaves hanging over by the window, now took a more menacing form. I still saw no reason to be afraid, I stared at the chair in my bed and saw nothing unusual about it quite common for the mind to take a moment to fully come to terms with what it is seeing. It takes time to put the full horror of what is in front of you together to a moment of cold, bitter realisation. Yes, I was staring at that old woman on chair in the dark, but when I, what I was also staring at was a person sitting in it. In a dim light, I could see the outline of the back of its head a rest obscured by the spine of the chair. I sat in motion, staring, praying, hoping that my eyes were being misled by their surroundings. A slow creak of movement as it shifted its battered throne. Chill me to my very core. This is no mere trick of the dark. Then I shifted into my right side. I knew that what it was doing, returning to look at me, it was difficult to make out, for even in that room, seemed darker than everything around it. I saw that it looked like a clutch of long fingers slip into my crest of the crest of the chair and then another. The room was silent but soundless things shuffling its seat and crashing my rate of my racing heart. At first I could only make out an outline its forehead, but it began to rise up revealing two pinpoints of light in the dark recesses. It's deeply it's deeply set I saw it. He was staring at me. I screamed within a moment. My brother and mother came into the room, switching light on, asking me if I had another bad dream. I sat speechless, barely acknowledging them, staring intently at the now empty armchair. It was the only in that room for another few, few days before we suddenly moved. I saw nothing for many nights except for my sleep. In that room where I woke, in the warm air, something breathing in my ear. I jumped out of bed, turning the light on, slow with my breath of something seen and remained louder than before. I spent the night, in the rest of the night, on a couch in the living room. Two days later, I slept soundly in my bed, in our new house. There had been no in other instances. I was sure I was left behind of whatever strangers had played me in that little average suburban house. I was ever less one 
I wish I was have left one potting gift my tormentors and in my opinion the watch in an armchair the different entity and the thing that balloon balloon to do had one last surprises on me like an animal grasping its territory it's not totally out I would not have totally out the dead grasp one last terrifying moment I felt the presence of these things I lay there sound asleep two years since those horrifying experiences as in the throes of a nightmare suddenly happily found myself awake safe and sound in my bed room was darker than usual I sighed a sigh of relief as one does when waking from a nightmare but the room was so dark I could see nothing at all as something snuffed out the light I chuckled to myself realising I must have pulled my blanket over my f- and up and over my face while sleeping the cotton ball blanket felt cool against me but the air was a little too warm almost stifling just as I was about to remove the blanket from some air I heard it the last time I heard it the rhythmic breathing of the watch at the end of my bed the air gripped me followed me by followed by anger and despair why could I not be left alone I then did something most peculiar I decided to speak to it Perhaps this thing did not mean to harm me. Perhaps it was unaware of the danger it had caused. Well, surely young boy deserves some mercy. As the breathing grew louder and louder, I began to cry. I could, not f- I could feel its presence on the other side of the blanket, its breath hanging over me like stagnant wind. With the tears, I uttered two words. Words which surely should have put an end to all this. Please stop. The breathing began to change, become more emanated quickly, quicker somehow. I could hear something shuffling next to me, standing close by. The breathing then moved first back to the front, to the foot of my door, then slowly across the room, through the door, into the hallway, and then gone. Half crying, half elated, I lay in the still darkness, my face was covered by the blanket. You may say this a victory of some sort, but I do not. These things were real, I now now beyond a shadow of doubt. Their intentions are not misconstrued. They are twisted and filled with malice. I would normally never use such a word to describe anything, but it's as close as evil as I hope I ever come. What do I know? How do I know that? I'll tell you, moments after that thing seemed to have left the house, something pushed, forced me down on top of me, pushing a blanket with great strength against my face. I could feel a large hand with fit long, thin fingers wrapping the covers around my skull, its nails imprinted upon me like a range of sharp ridges. I was furnished to slide down into a gap between the bed and the wall, quickly making my escape, clambering and screaming out of my room, waking my family. But no mistake. That thing in the darkness tried to smother me, smother me to, to death. Make no mistake, that thing that, that in the darkness tried to smother me, smother me to death. Part three, my fears realised. A few days ago, I submitted two malicious accounts of my childhood. Perhaps you best read and truly the end was befallen me. I've been compelled to silence, gripped by irrational fear, that somehow, even after all these years, shall I speak of it, that those, those things would seek me out and once again wreak havoc on my life. In the name of science, of reason confronted those fears and set out to vanquish so tormented memories once and for all by sharing them with others, exposing them, and for all what I believe they were, the delusions of a troubled child. I have held on my skepticism and rationality for dear life, if I ever allowed them to find me. But this morning I presented to be vulnerable, vulnerable full physical evidence, evidence of what I do not know, but it cannot be ignored. It seems strange to me. The last few days is so tainted by apprehension, misfortune. After finally breaking my silence, I could no longer rely upon entirely conventional explanations. In the wake of sharing these traumatic experiences I had as a child, I've been plagued by overwhelming sense of unease. Initially, I've attributed this to the fear that experience is simply recounting and reliving the terrible events on my mind. As the days passed, it felt like much, so much more feeling of impending doom consumed by every thought. 
For I see it came to me, rested not. Every morning I woke, my nerves on edge. It deprived, if I, if deprived of sleep for an age, nothing out of relief frightening happened during the first few nights of visit, no visitation, no unwelcome bedfellows, no wheezing breath screeching out from deep within my bedroom walls. But I had a sickly feeling, familiar feeling of not being alone. I do not understand, I do not sense someone in the room with me. I do not hear, smell or feel anything, almost remotely supernatural. But throughout the days and nights I have sensed something subdued, almost on the periphery of my awareness, the feeling that something is on its way, something is coming, like a few new first few stagnant blasts of the air from a subway st- tunnel, heriting the rival, lurching, unstuckable, monstrosity, surprising yet unexpected. My sense of unease grew my very passing day, pushing on its way upon my skin, deep into my mind like some form of cancerous infection. I tried my focus on my attention to various variety of projects in vain attempt to pull my mind up with a brim of those other faults, hopefully leaving my room those contaminated memories, but those faults came to me nevertheless. My anxiety grew in momentum until I could think of nothing else. I had to do something. I had studied psychology for years at a university. I, that, as this, I knew that anxiety is often a result of loss of control. And one of the most effective ways to go back to it is to empower oneself. This is what I intend to do. Call it foolhardy. I was going to go back to that place, that house where those terrible events took place. I was going to confront these memories, expose them for what they were. Nonsense. It was the hours. It was hours drive to my old home, but it was one filled with revelation. I was confident, I was hazed, happy, I was in control now, but nothing was going to get in my way. But nothing that place I heard, feared. My entire life was nothing but average, humdrum, harmless little suburban house. Gleefully negotiating the country roads and motorway, finally made it to the city. Gradually, the streets began to take an unfamiliar appearance. Memories of playing in that church neighborhood came flooding back to me. A play park, my favourite side, an etch pitch where we used to play football. My schoolyard field, hide and seek a friend just long ago abandoned but never forgotten. My mind wandered through these memories like a prodigal son, walking home. Wanted so much that before I realised it, I was pulling into the street I once lived. The road was long and disappeared far into the distance. Finally entering into a sharp line turn. It was my old neighbourhood. I'd been planned, been planned and built long before the event of the car. It is evident of the narrowness of its roads, creating a strangely catastrophic feeling as if, my, if the wheels is on each side rose up leering at passers-by. I slowed my speed and cast my eyes over each house and the past was a beautiful place where every house looked looking not dissimilar. My heart suddenly began to beat fast as a cold chill crawled up my spine. There it was. There was the house. Late afternoon, the street was quiet, almost lonely. I stared at that little place, wondering how much such an ordinary home could have instilled so much fear in me. I initially tried to look at the house from afar, confirmed to me as material construction, entirely explicable, and moved from anything uncanny. But as a part, I took a deep breath, and before I knew it, without my car walking towards the old mechanic gate, its once bright floral shapes now darkened by aged, flaking deep green paint, revealing nothing but the rust beneath, I ran my things over it fingers over it, uneven top and with sc- subtle grass I open, pushed it open looking along the path I shot to see how disused the garden was I thought to myself how much of the waste of good lo- how much of a waste of good lawn it was which was all but obscured by thick and molestic of, mo- of weeds and other invasive species but as near the house I realised why it was unoccupied once again, a shudder crept through me, but as my anxiety rose up, I crushed it with my rational mantra. The simplest of explanations is usually the correct one. I soon 
Due to the current and economic climate, house have probably been on the market for some time. I wasn't too aware of the old sentiment that the first bite is with the eye. But as I looked around, I could see no for sale sign, no one to, no one to let. It generally had been seen to be as it seemed. So that his house had been forgotten, abandoned, left to rot. The windows of the front of the house were filthy and so such as such were almost possible see through. I wandered around the back of the building, could see more clearly inside, could I have imagined that her house being this one will be empty, but on the contrary, totally occupied, occupied with trappings of modern life, because there's a television sitting in the room, room, room corner, a coffee table with magazines strewn across it, various pieces of furniture sitting, in, if ready to be used, a couple of coffee cups sitting in the window, still full of covered in mould, I would have thought the house was lived in, if I had not, for not a thick layer of dust, lying over everything occupied by the occasional spider web. It seemed as though the most recent occupants had left in a hurry and never returned. Clambering through the sea waste gra- high grass and bushes. Clambering through the sea of waste high waste sea waste high grass and bushes. I eventually arrived at an incredulous little window back of the house. The very sight of it frightened me, but this was a mere memory, not the strange feeling of being watched within it as I experienced as a child. Peering that room, I looked eerily familiar. I suppose it's little that could be done. A room is so small, so oddly narrow. Below the dirt covered of glass in the window, almost, um, almost, the room looked almost unchanged from where, when I slept in it. A bed, a set of drawers, and what looked like of toys on the floor frown a sense of anger washed over me momentarily I shook it quickly from my mind the room was clearly that a child had thought of the thing harming now the innocent filled me with contempt with such a thought within me swelled a desire to pocket my any child, protect any child such a number of domination I glazed at the wall on which the bed lay alongside it the head of my back and my neck stood up for a moment it was the far for a uh, it was for only the slightest. I thought I saw the blanket on top of the bed move. More than that, through the window pane, I could have sworn I heard a freezing grasp. Shut closed my eyes tightly, repeated another scientific mantra. Science does not, can't, not owe its debts to imagination. Opening my eyes, I saw nothing but an empty house, bedroom. I have no foul spirits, no end on earthly things, just a room, no more, no less, I breathed a sigh of relief, as it all was well with the world for the first time in many days. You may think it was wishful, think- wishful thinking, but I generally felt I have shown ev- myself there was nothing to be scared of, other than my own and active, overactive imagination. It was then uh, speaking, starting to get dark, and I wanted to, come, to be home before the night. Feel the confidence now that my anxieties were behind me. The one last thing I needed to do. When we had left the house, we did so in a hurry. My kid, as a childish disorienty, frightening me, leave everything I knew behind. But there was one thing left. I always, always went about. Starting to get dark, I wanted to get home before the night, filled with confidence now that my anxieties were behind me. One last thing I needed to do when we left that house, as we did so, now hurry. The child who did so he was frightened to leave everything that I knew behind. There's one thing left, which is always wondered about. A bottom of the garden stood a checkerboard tree, which looked about even older than the house. I was amazed at how changed it was. It's grown up some gone on to pass anew the old sycamore still stood wise warm almost friendly parents i think it's rights of passage my child to have a place to find things often there's first experience with independence something removed from any authority figure for me my stash was halfway up this old sycamore i sure it must have looked like a fool i happily gleefully climbed the tree with abandoned configuration of branches had changed in places over all the happy memories of playing amongst the limbs the old sycamore of having a little piece of the world
myself away from everyone else, seeing vivid as it was remarkable how much remained unchanged. Halfway up, I caught my breath and smiled to myself in the central trunk of the tree, a hollow, whether it had been created by an animal, or perhaps a tuck of a girl or a weakened branch long ago. I do not know, but it were where I kept things. I found out something which I was sure had been taken from me, for being appropriate into the hollow it would go. Truth is, though, the majority of the items inside were not very interesting, merely just toys and rather really exotic pieces of a van, like a swing shot or some smoke bombs. I had no reason to hide the toys, but it was I was young and felt adventurous to have a secret. Hollow was dark and filled halfway and with rotting leaves. No doubt this positive from the countless altars. Nevertheless, I reached deep inside to see what remained. I couldn't believe it. I found a toy uh, hidden where before we moved all those years ago. I could feel the pain in my mind. Its sharp edges unmistakable. The leaves and darkness to hollow obscured its view for me as I, as I struggled to move it from the thick, wet mixture of rotting leaves and rainwater. It seemed to be caught amongst a collection of small twigs. The reason I was so excited I knew would be when we moved. I left one of my favourite toys behind, a small plastic first world British soldier. May not sound like much, but I've grown up in a family story of my grandfather's adventures during both wars. And while he passed away before I was born, I often act out strategy versions of those stories. Versions of the stories with a small soldier in the role of hero, my intrepid grandfather. At the time I thought a hollow a perfect hiding place for a soldier. My diet, however, could turn quickly to the horror, but sick in my stomach. As I pulled the soldier out, I realised, not my toy, something else entirely stuffed in the back of the hollow. Amongst the s- slides of nail, my hand was scattered to remains of a small animal. The bones crunched together my grip as a small flakes of hair and flesh left on putrefied. On it, putrefied between my fingers, I almost lost my balance as rotten as the smell smelled death, escaped from my voice grass, invading my senses. I climbed back down carefully, dejected, with nothing else in the hollow. No, my toy was gone, probably taken by another child, probably s- another child during the subsequent years. What remained in a poor animal? I buried some, lo- I buried some loose earth in the ground. I left that place, that place immediately. Despite my unfortunate encounter in the hollow, I still felt empowered I had that I actually picked up the courage to visit to that revisit that place to see how ornery it was, really was made me feel in control once more my facilities. Did not at the time require anything other than conventional explanation. I said goodbye to my old neighbourhood to the bad memory once of all. Going to make my way home. By the time I'd driven to the hollow waterway, something began to filter through the back of my subconscious. At first I discarded it, dismissing it as my imagination, but the sun shone at last the dip below the horizon. I sensed a growing compulsion in me, and an idea which seemed to have been born and nurtured. For no reason, no rationale, no sound casually footing. Not one uh, which had fo- be followed, but one which had to be followed at all costs. I must go home. Increase my speed, zipping superbly between those slower cars on motorway, looking in the rear mirror and uh, keep my eye on what was must be might be following. I had to get home. Gonna go faster, constantly looking behind as if racing some unseen pursuer, seventy, eighty, a hundred miles per hour. I tore around along the road. I beeped, I yelled, the sweat lashed off at me. What was happening to me? Please, just get me, let me go home. While I knuckled, I finally made it off a motorway into the country roads, which led directly to my real town. The roads were narrow and went round around, now bleak and almost countryside. Darkness seemed to blanket the road in front of me. I turned to my beam, full on and breathed a sigh of relief to see bright light again, even if artificial. The manic bent his anxiety which seemed to grip me. Motorway appeared to have diminished. However, I still glared in the real, real mirror. Once more, I should have, just to make sure there's nothing to follow me. What a ridiculous fault. Think of something chasing my car. To put myself and others in danger of speeding down a busy 
so motivated. Madness. Still madness or not, I felt compelled to get away as quickly as possible, even though I managed to protect my nerves. The loneliness of the road I was on filled my yearning, my own town, my own street, my own bed. Nervously, I traversed the web like waning roads which seared for the countryside, feeling relieved at the first sign lent post of civilization. The boundaries of my town pulled outside my house, switching off. Switching on the engine office, sat in a moment in the silence. I had to stop all the monotonous nonsense. Things coming to walls, watches smothering me at night. Think looking in someone's window like a prowler. All this was lunacy. Tomorrow I would start afresh. No more writing about my childhood experience. No more reliving the dread field nights. Just getting back to normal, carrying out my work. Being time by my girlfriend. Most of all, reaffirming my belief, faith, and confidence in science of rationality. Then the thing in the back of the seat leant over, grabbed my, my shoulder and framed a foul, rancid breath from deep inside its lungs down the back of my neck. I scrambled the door, my arms spreading around, looking for the lock. Fear possessed me, shook me. Fear I remembered all too well, fear from those few years ago, lying awake at night in that sickening room, inside the car, growing much colder. There was nothing I compared to the icy fingers bearing my shoulder. I honestly thought I was going to die, that this thing would finally get its way after all this time. The door I had all popped in my panic grip. I fell out of my driver's seat into the pavement for the briefest of moments. I thought I caught a glimpse of something in the back seat, vague, a form of an old man. It twisted, sort of grinning from ear to ear. Luckily, there's no one around, so there, there, as there had been, I would have appeared a mad fool. The car was empty. I grabbed the keys from the ignition and booted the car shut with my foot locking it for the night. I staggered down the path into my house. I'm not going to lie to you, but I drank myself to sleep last night. I made a call that I had I said that evidence, actual physical evidence, something unnatural. You might be wondering what that evidence is. Well, I could say it was the marks on my shoulder that made me shudder with fear. Or I could tell you that my bedroom window I prized open this morning by what looked like claw marks was left me dreading tonight or any, uh, or any other but no one but no none of that scared me as much as what I saw upon waking something times the most frightening of messages of most simple but lying on a chest as I woke this morning the toy soldier soldier hidden that shut hollow all those years ago returned to me as an adult bitten in half Part 4. Something wicked this way comes. Last night there's almost heart-wrenching and frightening my life, so much that I can barely bring myself to contemplate it. But now I have submitted the occurred during my visit of that cursed place I once called home, a visit that was heralded and returned my childhood fears. No matter that fell thing befell me, but nothing could prepare me for the last night. After waking up to the chilly sight of that toy soldier, bitten in half, found in the window in my bedroom, was slightly ajar. A close inspection looked entirely as if the window had been prized open from outside. That should have went back out of position, as if subjected to a restricted, unbound brute force. From the outside looking in, I could see three indentations where the unwelcome housebreaker had used some kind of tool to leverage the window and naturally away from its hatch. Hatch. What was peculiar these markings of that that seemed to cut across the outside window frame like an old unreason uneven razor like a like a crowbar or another implement implement which would have merely left a dent where it had been used as a wedge to force the window open. Nothing had been stolen and attempted to rationalise the markings. The window was a human made, not claw like they appeared to be. Toy soldier turned to me so violently could explain, not explain, my heart sank, very thought of it. I knew it was a message, but it seemed to me so, some more of a twisted joke than answer arriving my childhood predator, rather than something to be puzzled over or interpreted. I spent the morning 
checking each room of my house and its contents, nothing was missing. Could only hope whatever that fiend been in my back seat of my car the previous night had only wished to frighten me by one last time. By not frighten me one last time when uh, then be its way. Perhaps it reach would be weakened so far from my childhood bedroom. It'd be too easy for any sane person to pursue themselves at persuade themselves that traffic traumatic event some anything more benign than this instance I could not that broken toy was not a mere joke, but a promise. A promise it would return. What for what I do not wish to know. My thoughts had actually tumbled inwards and began to those terrifying nights I had had as a child, and now reduced to the apprehension of bread time, the longing of the for the day and anxiety of the night, like an old and relentless enemy. Emily, en- enemy. My fear grew about the, the, for that day, festering inside me, leading a strange and ominous faults about the consciousness of whittling, bringing that thing home. Do not understand, misunderstand me. My fear was not simply for my own safety. Childhood believed that my nightly visitor was transfixed, grew my want in me, but I did not feel that my loved ones were in any danger. This, however, had changed. I did worry. This time I failed to feel nothing but fear for my loved ones. Because you see, I did not live alone. My girlfriend moved in together. I, I moved in together two years ago. I caused enough damage now. Do not wish to speak her name. I will we'll simply refer to her as Mary. Mary and I have a happy existence. In fact, we were very much in love. This coming Christmas morning I was going to propose to her. But that beautiful moment had been bitterly taken away from me by that rancid abomination. I knew that Mary would be home that evening. She works in events and promotion. The result is often away from home for days at end time, travelling around the city, country, coordinating various conferences and expeditions. I do not complain about this, as she and I both know my solitary character. The old days, few days, solitude normally do me good, observing me to drive headlong into my writing, solving each and every word I'm disturbed. Beside this... This, beside it, despite this, I always remember, I always miss her with the events of the past week, with living those torturous nights and then allowing them to return. I had missed her far more acutely than I'd ever previously done so. She arrived around 6 pm. I greeted her with a smile, a warm embrace, a passionate kiss. I tried to hide my perturbed ter- state of mind from her, but Mary knows me better than anyone I'd ever met and immediately inquired what's wrong. I tipped and fumbled over my, through my words. I explained that I had written a story about my childhood, exploring those night, dark and twisted memories that left me distorted. Mary had an incredibly caring nature. She immediately lay in a suitcase of bags on the floor, sat me down, sat me down on her couch, and her soft and gentle way forced me to talk about the whole ordeal. But I couldn't. I couldn't mention this thing, this wretched wretch which had found, found its way to a home, visible and twisted invader, been led there by an undulic curiosity. At the time I felt that she would think me mad. Now I wish I told her the truth. If there's one thing more damaging to a relation than a lie, it is half-truth. Because it's deceitful, because it's a corruption of the truth perverted, a, a view to suit the traveller's needs. I told her my half-truth. I told her about my story, that thing in a narrow room, the watch at the end of the bed, my bed, and that it was where the truth ended. A lie began, a deliberately, deceitfully mentioned. It was, of course, just my imagination as a child. The talk took my experiences returning to scene of the deprived crimes, knowing that she would see the damaged window latch and claw marks. I found my web as I told a grand tale, of waking up to a burglar attempting to break into our house and having to chase him away. I was quite the hero I lied to her. She showed me great sympathy and kindness for my deception. I was embarrassed by the truth then. I was ashamed of my lying now. If I had been untruthful, if I had been truthful, then perhaps we could have faced his menace together. But instead, the thing took advantage of my dishonesty, put a wedge between us. Events of last night desecrated, desecrated the most important thing in the world to me. Night time arrived, and all my bleak bleakness was welcome. 
It was unwelcome. I lay in the darkness, waiting. Mary was sound asleep next to me, each breath smoothing the mind of a companionship, despite my growing aversion to loneliness. I would not sleep that night. I knew from experience that when, from my, when my invited guess would show itself, it would go with subtly increasing its grip for me. Such vegeta- each vegetation required time to build its strength, a leech feeding on my hope, fear of Sagora. My nerves kept me on edge and fell, which fought back the oncoming, slow sort of sleep and merrily. In the end, though biology, though through biology one, my sped side clock lumbered at 4 a.m. Sleep took me, a relaxing bank at night, oblivion. Anxiety washed away, my worries, a distant memory, sinking deeper, soft mattress below, fun into steep, long salt for rest. Sleep, no matter how deep, is rarely all com- incomprehensible, compressing. But as I hovered over the cusp of the, the, the dream, something began to bother me, something invasive yet distant. I slowly opened my eyes and allowed it to adjust to the darkness. Mary lay asleep. I, I calmed myself to, by listening to her breathing. And then all night in hell was followed by exo again and again and we gradually hypnotically again to drift towards sleep once more. But no, there's something else is think yet indefinable. It's think but out of the way, almost skewered or smothered, as if coming from behind, something strained my ears into an attempt to find it. But it was all too quiet. I remained in the bed for several more moments. But each passing second, that almost inaudible sound grated me, like broken glass on a raw nerve. Sleep was now abandoned with such frustration as decided to reluctantly investigate the source of noise. I sat on the bed and listened intently. I was unlike any other noise sound I ever heard, quite low, but in my mind adjusted to the noise. I slowly began to piece it. Ne- his nature together, so certainly obscured by something, but the closest thing I could relate to. It was a repulsive, repetitive murmur. I heard something similar previously when I was a child visiting my grandmother, nursing home at a place which left an impression on me, seeing a wandering residence confused and affected, and in the affected mind, murmuring around, grounds like lost inmates, murmuring repetitively to themselves of days gone past repeating nonsense and phrases and words. And this is what it reminded me of, a furious dream of being several words uttered by someone in the thrones of confusion. I turned to check on Mary, watching my chest rise and fall. Every breath was sure she was undisturbed. I left the bed and I stood up and recognised immediately the murmuring was louder. While well, dark, I left a light on the hall, as I always do with the crept under the door, allowed me to view the room in the... In, in a dim but visible way. I looked round to see if anything was out of place. The room appeared to the suspected. A mind ambled back to that night as a child in a second room. A noise would be heard from the unsummoned scene, the other over, ever-present menace. I took a step to walk forward as I did, so the noise once again grew in volume. But I was lost, to a loss in deciphering the words. I could now hear the character of the voice. Dull, scratched by age, with a harsh, guttural undertone to it. The words were being repeated to frantic pace, almost anxious yet muffled by something, by some, some barrier. I was frightened. I drew strength from Mary, being in the room, being in the room, and with deep breath filled with interpretation. I took another slow and silent step towards my bare feet, cushioned by the cold floor below. Again the voice became louder, I wasn't sure, I was imagining it. I could have sworn, became more agitated as, as I drew closer. Next step I took showed me to my very core, as that muttering, gravelled voice grew louder still. Amongst the rambling, gravel sound of it, I heard a word, a word from shot of icy shadow through my bones, a word to be feared. It spoke my name. Dear God, it knew my name. To, to me, as knowing who I was, somehow endowed that thing with an inanimate reach. It may never be rid of it, and it would kill me any moment. Tony suddenly caught my eye, a movement accompanied by a ruffled cloth. 
You now wear the red 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 a agitated voice originated. I knew how now what is muffled and difficult to cipher. I could now see it. Now only a few feet in front of me, standing, standing and behind the closed curtains. No news in sense. Outside, and while its glimmer would not entirely penetrate, the thick cloth could barely and faintly outline the thing watching my window and the curtains. I could now not now convey the strangeness which overcome me my anxiety and terror to heightened but unusual compunction and timely sense of purpose took me over i had to see what it was i took another tentative step towards the curtain a sway slightly as if caught by a breeze I could not tell whether the movement caused by myself or the hand and thing hiding by a shroud of cloth and now close enough to hear it laboured breathing the displacement of fluid the back of its throat plattable with some inhalation this was it uh, coming to confront this much strategy by pass the mentor of a child is coward raising my right hand slowly I actually touched the gently touched the fabric of the curtain causing a subtle ripple which parted and momentarily I gasped for the for the temporary slit only for a moment I saw it my god how can I describe what was standing there even now I close my eyes I wish I could erase it my memory shivered and shook Continued to murmur, repeating some insufferable phrase, sending a bizarre mix of gnomous languages, and making his skin stretched over a natural frame of brittle and permanent bones, vertebrae, ribs, and other inner workings, almost fruiting its fever thin, pale, languid, pink, almost bruised looking husk, malnourished as it appeared, his stomach was distended to places, bony appearance did nothing to diminish the feeling capable of exerting itself with brute the very faults of any of, on any of its victims. Sickness filled my stomach, a ta- taunted offensive smell filled the air as it murmured and whispered in the darkness food that sounded the sound like fractured teeth. I could not help but feel pity for its wretch, quivering in the night as if a victim of long starvation. I quickly came to my senses, realised that this thing was not to be pitied but feared, not to be assured but exposed, not sh- Shivering, that because it's cold, it's shaking with excitement like a drug addict, preaching, anticipating the next fix. Suddenly, the uh, contemplating, I just seen behind the curtains. I once again prepare myself to remove its shrouded, closed protection, to remove the, what it was a cold hearted vandal, proud of the worst kind, the deviant, festering, its own de- de- delectation. As I once again raised my hand to draw the curtain, something caught my attention. Creasy, confused, gravelly, and in articulate whispers, queased through the broken mouth and uttered the three most terrifying words I have ever heard. Look behind you. A cold breath slid down my neck. Motorly foes, but love is a powerful motivator. Here I brought my own fear that would have taken me shaking any possibility of resistance in my mind. A very sunny, sleeping sunny, same room as this thing, shielding someone I wished, love for the wretch, was my only fault. I turned around slowly, and I did so, I could hear it, wheezing, grasping, groaning for air, caught a turn, I could smell its breath, a stench of death, hung in the air, plague like foul, and I heard another voice, it's not a a horror in the darkness, but merry. Let a scream which startled and distressed me, my very core, a scream which haunt me for the rest of my days. I turned quickly and laid my eyes on it, but not it wasn't behind me, it was on my bed. It rivered and rasped, wheezing in a delight its bony spine, curved, anguish of countless years protruding for its ragged, torn piece of cloth, which hung loosely on its torso, a vain attempt to peer almost human. But was it human? Had it once been human? Or was it something so vile, so despicable, so utterly and sorrowful, contemptible, and no man or woman would ever attempt to quantify it or understand it? I sprang toward, forward towards it, grabbing, hissing, pulling at the thing. Every ounce of my strength it loose skin, slipping from my hands, squeezed and forced Mary's face into a pillow, glee as the other limbs arched and contorted, tearing at a nightdress, running its long, starred fingers over a naked body with solid caresses. 
sorted caresses. Mary's screams were muffled by the wind pillow. I began to fear that she'd been suffocated. I shouted, I yelled, I pleaded with the thing to leave her alone, to take me to anything wanted. But they only served to animate the fiend to even greater depths of depravity. It is hurting me. Her, cutting her, my beautiful Mary. Suddenly as it stopped attacking her, but it still kept one his brittle gangling caught yet weighted hands on the back of Mary's head, pushing the head further into the pillow. I had my hands around its putrid neck, trying at my best that I could have strangled the beast by my efforts in vain, its scrawny frame belined its overpowering strength. I watched his sickly belief as it began to run its con- cadaverous fingers through Mary's hair slowly in almost affection. I could not now have I could now and hear with twisting and crackling and bone and popping cartilage, snapping attendance. Thank God it was not coming from Mary. It now on its back of my arm wrapped around its throat. It now on its back, on back of my arm wrapped around its throat, my chin rubbing against the brave of skin on its shoulder. And if a spine dug sh- sharply in my stomach, I twisted its head in my tire in, in a human way. It then clicked and groaned on the strain of every altruistic moment movement that it hindered by a thousand years of Ricomotus. It is now looking at me. I have heard of it it's often said that some people they look cannot see the forest for trees, but now I truly anticipate the sentiment so close it was was as it was black, icy stare. I could not take in I could not take in surrounding features. Crease my grip, I swore, I screamed, I would have torn throat off if I could have. But all in vain as I continued my run my scrawny fingers through Mary's not hair nonchalantly while looking at me. I did not think I could fully recover from the sound which seeped out from what I assumed to be approximation of a grin. A wheezy sigh, a grunt, something sounded very close, sinister, an overwhelmingly laugh. As a face touched mine, its eyes stared deep into me. Even not even my fetcher returned, no looking glasses, its sanctuary of the dark, devoid of light happiness or love, it's staring she wished to say something to me, it's staring to communicate a simple idea to me. Malice. Wretching stuttered and violent movement, it tore an entire fistful of hair from Mary's head, leaving behind an open wound. It was gone. Mary did not scream. She did merely whimpered. It turned the lamp bed so I learned on. So I lamp on. And her words of chaos simply could control, control her. She wept uncontrollably. Bed was soaked with blood that seeped out from numerous scratches on her back. With large cut from a tired section of her hair. When once been, I hugged her. Told her everything would be all, be all right. And she looked at me. Looking as the tear filled eyes, I knew she thought to meet me. She thought that I had attacked her. I had done these terrible things to her. All the experiences I had, the look of a trail, disgust, contempt on Mary's face, and may remain the most painful. He's gone. After composing self, he covered up some things and left. I tried to explain, I tried to tell her everything that had been happening. She would not listen. Who would believe such a preposterous story? He simply said she would not call the police. But if ever I continued to contact her, she would do just that. To her, I was aggressor, not that thing. I left. She turned to me to look at me one last time and burst into tears. I know now that I lost her forever. A woman I loved more than anything deserved thinks I'm a violently hideous human being. If only she could understand whatever this did this was not human. It was never was. If ever was. It long since abandoned that nature. It's 5 a.m. when Mary left me. It's 9 a.m. now. I'm sitting in a cold light in my uh, day, a kitchen table, writing this. So there's some record that was transpired. The people know, the so Mary knows whatever happens. Whatever occurs from here on, in that it was a despicable creature from my childhood. A cursed narrow room, all these years ago, which rained this misery put upon me and upon us. I now dispense with the sentiment. I could easily sit the morning the loss of my relationship with Mary. I could allow oh, I could allow myself to overcome the fear. Do nothing. I certainly will not will not do. 
hear the laughter of my neighbor's children outside. Different stage of my life, I remember that same feeling of joy and happiness. Something as simple as playing with friends, climbing a tree, kissing a woman you love, even drifting off to sleep at bedtime to dream, or what could be the most of happy family home memories only memories of fear I never experienced that happiness again this thing had broken me by some resident whatever this city is rich has in store whatever it desires to do with me I will not allow the thing to harm another person or beat never chosen life as I did mine all those years ago I must leave now as there's much to be done before it gets dark when it returns my plans are made, are made. Any luck they would succeed, I wish I could say. We speak again. I think that is unlikely. I hope you understand what must be done for tonight. I'm going to kill it. Part 5. Sleep tight. I sleep shaking as I write this. I released by the police less than two hours ago and compelled to record events the past day and night quickly, as accurately as possible. Some ways I want to forget, but I know I cannot. I know that I should not. For my own sanity, I must divulge what has happened. It is far more too important. Should I ever allow myself to be swayed by mechanical, rational nature of the world? Once again, these words serve me to remind me that the body is unseen is both mysterious and frightening. After Mary left me, I knew I'd lost her forever. But rather than be consumed by depression and action, I reverberated for one purpose, for one thought, one idea I knew to carry out, destroy that thing. I could not allow the chance it may be one day hurt my loved ones, desecrate the innocence of another child. I know so know that death I face death, but simply had already lost everything. A small piece price to pay it said that revenge is best this best this best served cold, but having waited my dire night of life, be rid of this thing, bear me a shadow it could be cast upon me. Permit the position of killing this fiend is cover up and prevented false. With a smile on my face, that word would be dead, even had to drag it to the helm with me. Busy myself a few hours, I packed a bag of my night and night to marry my family, explaining what had happened. I wasn't to blame, I phoned my mother, my father, my, my brother, just to hear their voices one last time. I did not let on that I thought I'd never speak to them again. I was in into tuition they did not ask if something everything was all right i smiled and told her i loved her before rapidly saying goodbye at about seven o'clock i made my way to the car the sun was really set and the street seemed really quiet as if a scene of an intended funeral i sat on drove his seat leaving the door on his other side open waiting my own most my most unwelcome passenger my nine p the clock, nothing out in the awning had occurred. The place remained deserted and cold air. Flowed through the open door was beginning to bite. I sat there complicated echoed from my complication echoed from my mind and ruminated on the nature of this covetous parasite. One question rose at sea of thought, towering above all else, moving continuous. Can you kill something that which is already dead? I don't know which is thing or the grave some unworldly spectre would consider alive some way but he was reiterating my plan there was it was it's subtle at first it was a small almost in single shift of suspension of car had it been in any circumstance I would put this down to a gust of wind pushing and pulling at the I do to ruin that feeling but all those years ago as a bunk bed it would shift slightly a thing climbing to bed bottom bed knew its foul calling card the air grew denser as I contaminated by some nearby corpse it was in the car with unseen eyes it was nevertheless as I heard the slightest whisper breaths from the back seat I let over and calmly closed the pressure door I turned the key ignition as I pulled out the street I could have sworn I heard a quiet instinctively malicious stinger as something mocking me did it know what I had planned for it destination was not far from uh, the roaming hills through on that taken country road, penetrated roads up and diminished with regularity. A stark reminder of anonymous insulation of night. Occasionally on the way, I had to hear something from the dark behind. I refused to look. The thing in the dark, patiently, would be long before I could, f- it would not be long before I could, f- would confront it. The irony hit me as I worried about scarf, 
It's going off the same thing which terrified and tortured me. The child I, I, I had to be resolute, so to rove carefully and calmly throughout the country. I swelled my darkness, hoping that my unearthly visitor, Pashida, would not suspend me. suspect me. I arrived. The wheels of the car struggled and slid on the undergrowth. They headed off the narrow country road. This landscape opened up as I looked at the broken and rotting trees around me. I felt it was fitting to come to this bleak place in the cold night. Destroy that bleakest of things. The land suddenly came to an abrupt end. It was a cliff etched out from old quarry. Looking deep in the black waters of the lake below, the cliff which was relatively flat, and in fact, an old, at one time, had a road which subsided in the lake decades earlier. Local kids had told stories about the vengeful ghosts of those killed during such subsidence. They're just stories, so perhaps they wasn't. In past, I would have disregarded these t- such tales. I would have believed mine if I told it to them now. I switched the engine off and parked several metres away to its edge, switching on lights, composing myself what would come. I sat in a car for what seemed a lifetime. Only a company given to me occasional splash of water against the cliff. Below, I waited. The thing was smart, and there was no doubt. I toyed with me, relishing the pain of torment. It caused my own eyes only something a coldly frozen intellect could. For this reason, they knew it would suspect me. Even flee if I brought the car too close to the cliff's edge. I had to wait for it to attack. Let it feel, let it reveal. Revel and gorge itself on me. Itself on me, perhaps it would not notice. I slowly purged the dark, car the dark, icy water below. Oh, now I'm going to drown the bastard. I hope I pray to potential conquerors in my head. A reason it would be a moment, a singular moment, a slim opportunity to escape from the car, just before it reached the edge. Mary and I used to go there occasionally, a place to be together with every, from everything else. Did not look nearly as stark during the summer day. I therefore had the place in mind and knew it well. Drop was at least 30 foot in the depth below. I did not want it to be a car as it hit the water nor trapped inside with that of domination. I waited. I heard it. Slowly at first, an increasing rate and volume, a rasping, breathing breath behind. Strangely, it sounded more laboured than before. Each breath is struggled, filled with fluid, rotted, decayed. A shiver ran up my spine. A rank, foul smell began to fill the air. The breath drew closer from behind. Heart began to race, beating hard. Fast I looked up and saw the windscreen began to ice up. And inside I saw my breath. A natural thing indeed. What was unnatural was the breath visibly moving across my face from the side. I turned slowly. I wanted to cry. I wanted to run, leave, run into the night. But I had no to stay. Couldn't, I, could not, I, did, I could not allow it to escape. I was sitting in a passenger seat. I was staring at it, and it at me, hunched over, covered by darkness, contorted gold hands seized by fighting rigmortis. It slowly moved towards me. One bony leg cracked and groaned. It slid under my lap and into the other, onto the other side. Oh my God, it was sitting on me. It pulled itself close to me, and slow its shadow light, by the moon, I saw its face hang. Skin hung, its jagged features, glassy eyes, stared deep into me, and gr- spread, grin spread, with face unnaturally wide, as a result of its half rotten flesh, exposing the f- rotten muscles, broken teeth, and sewers, rancid smile beneath. But it closely opened its mouth, revealing a wet and putrid tongue could be seen throughout part of its missing jaw, wheezing, breathing heavily, a foul stench that stunned my eyes, filled my mouth, it solicited, sponsored me as it wretched my as I wretched my body attempting to spell its poisonous fumes, as it so stopped for a moment, then it cackled to itself, happy contentment. 
staring into my its cold its icy cold eyes and it yet gave the impression of inflection increasingly weak old man I still it was still incredibly wrong strong but it seemed as though it lost some of its potency perhaps leaving the illuminated room somehow affected it long protruding fingers caressed my face in a slow of contempt content. I snuck up it struck one of the deep to my shoulder screams that bent it bent and twisted inside my rotting fiend moved his finger to cause a maximum amount of damage and pain that it could as he did so another hand slid against my body it touched me it was time with my free arm I turned on the ignition and through my shoulder still pinned to the seat I managed to fight for the pain put the car in the gear and took off as far as I could the creature failed and screamed it attempted to climb over me back of the seat I held on with all my strength and thoughts of what it did to Mary enough to feel my rage we raced towards the edge of the cliff I eyed the driver's door frankly as we were near my and our icy plunge I screamed in anger as it frustrated and ran its face and pushed it off of me it scrambled in the back seat as dear life into di- I, it scrambled into the back seat for dear life I scrambled for mine by locking the door door it's too late the car could rear it off the great face before I knew it we hit the water dark water splitting the dark black glass surface tremendous force I should have died then but the airbag took the blunt of my impact though I still managed to scrape my head across the door frame Days I looked around, the sound that's heard coming from a thing was malformed yet familiar. The squeal of some demonic child, some soon gave way to anguish of rage. The ancient intelligence knew it was faces, but again, almost certain death. The water was frozen, poured through now, twisted, put open, car door, such force it wounded me. I grasped for air, my winning brain did, now did. It withered and twisted, it looked for an exit. Spraying the door open, it pulled itself in the water towards me. I curled my fist and smashed it to the thing's face. Pieces of rotten flesh flaked off under my impact as a dark black liquid oozed from the resulting wound. Again, it attempted to put it past me. I knew I had to keep it in, the, in that door lo- car long enough to drown. I would have to di- have to die with it. I felt numb as the frozen water slipped up my chin. My heart st- struggled against the cold. Sudden surge, I submerged and breathed my last. Felt my breath. I did compose. I readily myself for an icy suffering death. I hoped it would not be painful. My thoughts had turned to Mary, my family, and all consuming sense of sadness and despair overwhelmed me. But as I struggled with that thing, I tried to put, get past me, through the door, grabbing and frowning with its arms. I looked down and saw it. My le- it, sorry, my leg was trapped between the deck board and the floor of the, the car. The impact of the fall. His leg was trapped between the dashboard and the floor of the car. The impact of the fall. That he wouldn't, he could move. He could not leave. I turned immediately for the door. I barely see what the foot in front of me. In the dark water. But there's enough moonlight for led my way. Lit my way. But as I got to the door, the wretched wretch grabbed hold of me. And pulled me back to it. It, given, it had not given up all hope of escaping. It wanted to drown me with it. It had given up all hope of escaping, but it wanted to drown me with it. We thought that what felt like an age in a bitter cold grave. Cars slowly sank deeper and deeper in the darkness. I could now feel my body pleading for me to take a breath, sell my last glass of air, inhale the frozen water. I am happy to say. I used my wits to get out of such a horrible fate. Orientating my body, pushed my foot against the dashboard with enough force to bless escape. A slimy, slippery grass. I don't remember much else. Oh, anguish and hateful scream. My tormentor let out, so I left it die at the bottom of the icy lake. I myself found myself awake. Wake, myself awake, walking for the wilderness, cold but wet, wet. But alive, the wound of my shoulder slowed me down. I felt the bleeding of my bay, applying pressure of it with my other hand. It took me two hours to walk home. I am amazed I did not collapse from exhaustion of hypothermia. When I saw the familiar sight of the street I lived on, I feel a sense of accomplishment, a sense of pride and triumph. I had beaten the thing once and for all. Until I went into my, inside my house, I found a trail of large wet footprints leading from the front 
door, my bed, disbelief took me, despair so sharp, my overwhelm, so overwhelming, I was unable to convey it with mere words, lying on bed, waiting, a white sheet, covering an emaciated sight from a body from sight, human mind is a wonderful thing, just as I believe your body has reached a level of exhaustion, you, that you can, cannot recover from, the emotions are so afraid, you feel you cannot continue, a thought springs as it's it's miraculous, my weary mind, let it rest for now. I quietly crept through the dark and picked up my wallet, which I had left on a small coffee table in the center of my living room. Leaving the door unlocked, left to attend to a new plan, returned an hour later. With a moment's preparation, I slipped in the spare room. I lay in that unsalted bed, waiting. I was sure that this was the end game, so it told me it could come to kill. But now I had escaped that water rave, I did not know what it, but I would be damned if I would not escape it again I would only hope that it would sense me from that other room from the other room I closed my eyes but I intended to be silently tying lumbered onwards I could I'm already, although already thought it exhausted funny took exhaustion funny took me sending me to utter into deep slumber With its hands around my neck, like coughed and sputtered at the top of me, its rancid black liquid dripping into my face. As it oozed its fractal wounds, I struggled, grasping for air, hoping it had the strength, I had the strength to, in the meat to escape its grasp. Too strong, my hands could not grip it. it with any sense of conviction, it seemed to be dripping wet from its plunge into the lake. It may not seem rational at the time, but a vision dimmed the last light of consciousness, extinguished in me. I did so many animals do in the last moments. I played dead. I motionless, holding my breath, shook me violently in my, in my neck and released me. I waited for a moment. My last chance to destroy this thing. This laboured, breathing, relaxed, slightly started to stare at me, almost quizzically. I waited to steal for a tr- draft of weight might have to let me throw it to the ground. Leaning down close to me, his wide, crumbling sneer puckered. Gathering his putrid saliva in his mouth, it was left in what was left in its cheeks. It showed, showed utter contempt for the living and the dead. It spat its festering fluid on my face, the remnants dripping down onto, onto me through the hole in its jaw. I wanted to scream or do anything to move such a world smear my skin. I did not move. Time was not right. Leaning in closer, I prodded and scratched at the wound of my shoulder, pain steering from my body, but all my resistance remained motionless. Then it slowly and patiently slid to its long, distended fingers. My mouth, the taste was overwhelming, rancid, rotten, dead. A referistic clicking with its knuckles so- shook my resolve as it arched its back, its glee, suddenly pushed its fingers down. Deep down into my throat, I gagged an instinctive reaction. Instead of being shot, the garbled laugh in an intimated, emancipated for his broken teeth as it thrust his fingers deeper into my mouth. I felt it cold, hard flesh scraping against the inside of my throat, pleading without words for it to stop. Darkness of moments we sometimes find our true strength. I rolled on my side, using its weight against it, finally managed to break free, fell on the floor, its long, grasping, long reach grasping. My feet I kicked and screamed and last of three stared at me only for a moment. Rising on top of the bed, its brittle bones cracking under its force, now tall and tall, a gaunt ready to pronounce. So as a child had been a victim, been terrorizing me since taking my innocence attacked, Mary had broken my life. I will not stand it for any more. Sometimes the most dangerous prey is the one who cannot can think you uh, can outthink you. The one that lures you to a false sense of domination, superiority. The one that has conquered any fear of you. A sense of anger, betrayal. I have fallen into my trap. One can see by logic, reason, and understanding of the world. The eyes of a scientific mind. The eye at ends is all it groaned, screeched, crackled, and contorted. Reading itself to pounce in one swift motion. I revealed a blanket. F- Moved a blanket floor. Revealed a bucket filled with gasoline. I brought in that short time of preparation. I knew it as hard as I could. A liquid splashing all over a hole in the bed. 
He grinned at me, mocking my very existence, making light of my pain and agony and calls. My pocket pulled out a lighter. I lit it and threw it, uh, threw it into the wretched thing. He withered and screamed at agony, parts of flesh crumbling away, seeing nothing in the left front of my very eyes. I was so sorry for it. Let it burn the fire I was out got at hand. Paying a neighbour in a heard the screams and saw the smoke. Calling the fire brigade, I remember nothing of how it escaped. I spent several hours in the hospital, we treated for light smoke elimination. Alation and painful burns on my hands. It still hurts as I type, but it's some superficial wounds from will. Perhaps there will be a few scars, but I will can live with that. Please arrest me shortly afterwards. Believe me, a murderer. Expect I killed someone in the fire. I find it entirely suspicious. I have a deep wound in my shoulder. Scratches of my body. I even told them not to stay far in case they wish to ask me. There are questions that they, they can ask away. I doubt they will believe my answers. If there remains no evidence of anyone that someone else had been there... By a strange outline of a figure etched deep in the bed, a wall it looked as though whatever had attempted to escape. I did not f- think it accomplished this. A weight had been lifted from my shoulders once, and now realised it always there. Since there was a child of fact, I believed that thing had affected me again from even from a distance. Now it was gone, I feel whole again. I devastated that I lost Mary in my house. Can be written off as a probably charged with arson. Of that, re- that I realised I sought the fire. We I a kiss goodbye to any insurance claim. My hands ache so does my, as my shoulders do. My spirit does not. I'm writing this from my hotel room. Small and assuming, but it suit, suit my purpose. Tonight I intend to sleep and dream. I did as a child. Before that wretched wretch invaded my life. I believe it was irrational, for which is, is my irrationality it saved me by logical fault, allowed me to destroy such an evil. I never escaped conclusion. There is much more to life beyond the veil. Out there in the darkness, the world has not been seen. Do not care and revisit, but tonight I will rest and tomorrow I will be on my night again. Confidence, my unwelcome guest, gone forever. I can feel it, I know. Take time for me to adjust and practice my mind. We'll play a trick or two along the way. Difficult to abandon, paranoia of a lifetime. I must learn to set my safety once again. Refuse to be looking over my shoulder for the rest of my days. I always be cautious, as I was when I was in hospital. This morning, lying on a bed in a quiet ward, I thought I felt the bed shake for the briefest moments, but I knew that was just my imagination. I'm glad I've written down my experiences. It's illuminated much about myself to me. Most importantly, should anyone ever, God forbid, find yourself in a similar situation, situation and maybe you know what to do now it's bedtime i must rest for i've never known a weariness such as this good night and sleep tight